everyone. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube later or if you're on Twitch here, welcome, welcome. Thanks for viewing. Um, phylogenetic trees is going to be the next topic. Um, so phylogenetic tree of life, um, we all know that life on Earth started from a single origin and then it kind of diverged into different um, clades, which we now call bacteria, archaea and eukaryota. So hey, multicellular organisms, the bacteria and the archaea, which are the extremophiles, so the animals living near like uh, fountains or these, these warm water sources on the bottom of the oceans. Um, so this is based on ribosomal RNA data. Um, hey, and when you make a tree like this, a phylogenetic tree based on rRNA, then it emphasizes the separation of uh, bacteria, archaea, and uh, eukaryota, um, because ribosomal RNA is very, very stable. So it, it doesn't mutate very much and it, it stays very similar, right? Because ribosomes are a very, very essential part. So you can look back a, a long, long way back in history. If you would do the same thing for proteins, you're not going to look back that much. Um, so if you if you look at um, other proteins which have recently evolved, then um, you don't see this big, big split in, in, in bacteria or eukaryota. So um, the idea of a phylogenetic tree, if you look at a phylogenetic tree made of proteins, then the branching diagram shows the inferred evolutionary relationship or the inferred evolutionary distance between or amongst different proteins. Of course, uh, a phylogenetic tree is based upon similarity and differences in sequence or in structure. So you can make a, uh, because the amino acid sequence of a protein can change, but the structure of, this, of, the, of the protein can remain the same. Right, because you can change a long non-polar fatty acid side chain by another long non-polar fatty acid side chain, and the, the protein doesn't really change. So the, the the sequence has changed, but the structure did not change. And when you look at a tree, and so if you see taxa which are joined together, like here, right? So you see that archaea are joined at this point with eukaryota. That means that at some point there was a common ancestor for both in the group. Right, so here we can also see that, for example, if we look at animals, hey, that there is a common am ancestor between animals and plants and, and fungi. Hey, but for example, there's also a common ancestor between uh, Metanosarchina and Halophiles, hey, which is more or less located here. Right, so that's the idea of a phylogenetic tree. So the idea behind a phylogenetic tree is that hey, if you have two, two taxa coming together, so two of these uh, three branches coming together, then it implies that there is a common ancestor to these species. All right, so when we talk about these trees, we have to talk about orthologs and homologies. Um, so the uh, a homologous sequence, so a sequence which is deemed homologous, um, like when you do homologous uh, recognition, is um, has, so an homologous sequence is called orthogonous if they are inferred to be descended from the same ancestral sequence separated by a speciation event. Right. So if we have um, a duplication event within a single species, then these two sequences are not orthologous, but they are homologous. So then there is a homology because they are they have the same kind of sequence. Hey, but an, an orthologous sequence or orthology is strictly defined in terms of ancestry. Right? And orthologs often but not always have the same function. Right? So we have for example mice and human and both of these carry myostatin as a protein. So the myostatin from mouse is an orthologous protein of a myostatin in human. While within human you have myostatin, uh, and, or not myostatin, if you look at um, myoglobin and um, some other forms of myoglobin, because hey, myoglobin is the, the stuff that binds oxygen in blood, um, but you have different proteins which also do like uh, oxygen binding within a cell. These are homologous proteins but they are not orthogonous because they occur in, in a single species, right? So remember that when we talk about orthology, we talk about speciation events. So when, when a single species splits into two species, then the same protein, which used to be in one species, is now in two species. So now these two proteins are called orthologous. 
To make it even more complex, we can say that two species, so homologous sequences, right, so sequences which are highly homologous, so which are very similar to each other, they are called paralog if they are created by a duplication event within the genome. And then we define two types of paralogs even. We define in paralogs, so those are paralogs which arose after a speciation event, and then we have out paralogs which are paralog pairs that arose before a speciation event. So and it's just a little bit of terminology because I, Ed, when you build these trees, then often people just assume that this tree is the relationship that it used to be, but it, or that, that it really represents the relationship between species, but it doesn't have to. Um, yeah, but by defining something as an in paralog or an out paralog, hey, you kind of annotate these trees with saying, well, no, here we have the speciation event and a certain gene occurred or hey, is, arose before or after it. Um, hey, and this has to do, so, hey, Paralog sequence are sequences that are created by a gene duplication event, so the, the part of the DNA is just duplicated, and then have we we say that well, when when this when this happened before, then we are talking about um, out paralogs, and when it happened after a speciation event occurred, then we call it in paralogs. So just as a picture to show you guys, right? So for example, here we have the early globin gene. Right? And the early globin gene at a certain point got duplicated into the genome. So we have the early globin gene which got duplicated and one of them became the alpha chain and the other one became the beta chain. So now when we talk, all of these sequences are homologs of each other. Because the alpha chain is very similar to the beta chain in globins, hey, it just has some minor amino acid changes. Um, but hey, when we talk about the alpha chain, then of course the alpha chain is found in frogs and chickens and or, uh, frogs and chickens and, and mouse, right? And and the alpha chain existed because of the gene duplication event being here. So an alpha chain, an alpha gene, an alpha chain gene is a homolog of a beta chain gene. But the frog alpha chain is an orthologous gene to the chicken alpha and to the mouse alpha. The same thing holds for the mouse beta, the chicken beta and the frog beta. But the mouse alpha and the mouse beta are called paralogs, right? Because they are the same um, and so a, a paralog is, 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 they are created by a duplication event, and, right? But because the duplication event was here before the speciation event, um, we call these paralogs. And, and since this duplication event was before, then we actually call this an out paralog. So here we have, in, in a single picture, we have the difference between what a homolog is, an ortholog and a paralog, right? So a paralog is the same homologous sequence in mouse, an ortholog is the same homologous sequence in, in two different species, and to have uh, the in and the out paralogs and the orthologs a little bit more clear, um, let's say that we have an ancestral gene A, right? Then the gene got duplicated, so we now have A, um, A, A bar and we have A bar bar, right? And now after this we have a lineage divergence, Right, so the gene duplication event was here, and then we have the divergent between different species, for example, species X, I, A1 gene, species Y, A, A1 gene, then these two are called orthologous, and these two are also called orthologous. An in paralog is now when we compare Y, A bar to Y, A bar bar, right, because the, this now the duplication event is before the lineage divergence, and we call it an, an in paralog when we look, uh, we call it an, an out paralog when we look at, now I'm messing it up again. <sighs> so, so tricky. I hate that people call it like this and make like terminology so difficult. All right, so we start off with ancestral gene A. Gene A is duplicated into A bar and A bar bar. A bar is then split by two different species, right? So we have a speciation event after the gene duplication event. So now we call A bar within the same species orthologous, 
we when we compare a bar with a bar bar within the same species it's an impair lock but when we compare it with with a different species then we call it an out pair lock i hope that it's clear i don't really like many of these definitions in a way but they are related to how we in biology or people in biology talk about proteins and homologous sequence and uh, impair logs being orthologous to each other so i hope it's a little bit clear um, i have two pictures so just look at the pictures and see and otherwise just ask a question about it next time then i will read up on it again and it's just confusing to make it even more confusing we also have something called xenolog and xenologs are really interesting right because homologs res uh, resulting from horizontal gene transfer between two organisms are called xenologs and this occurs a lot in bacteria right so imagine that we have bacteria a for example uh, e coli right which has a certain antibiotic resistance gene right so what this e coli can actually do is it can actually transfer its or give its gene to another bacterial species Right, so here we have the, the same gene now occurring in both species, but E. coli gave it to another one, either using horizontal gene transfer or, or conjugation or some other method. Right? Generally, like bacteria talk to each other through these little tubes and they, they, they exchange DNA with each other. And so when this occurs, we call this a xenolog. So we now see the exact same gene in two species so from a, a phylogenetic tree standpoint this would make the two species related to each other but they are not related to each other at all they ju it's just that e coli gave one of its genes to streptococcus right so this this the, in a phylogenetic tree hey, we would now see that oh okay so there has to be a common ancestor between streptococcus and e coli but there actually isn't. It is just because of a xenolog, so a transfer of DNA from one species to the other. And this happens more often than you think. This also happens to more complex organisms, not just bacteria. Um, DNA is actually something which is exchanged quite frequently by bacteria amongst each other, but also by uh, multicellular species. So also multicellular species can exchange DNA, making them look more similar to each other, right? So then you infer that, oh, there might be a common ancestor like one million years ago, while actually that is not the case because the real common ancestor is like hundreds of millions of years ago. And this is because of, of xenologs. So when we talk about horizontal gene transfer, right, from a bacteria to another bacteria, then this can happen in different ways. So the most common way is transformation. This means that there is a bacteria which dies and part of the DNA from the bacteria, like a bacterial plasmid, like a little circle of DNA, remains after the bacteria exploded, right? So we can have an E. coli bacteria, it has a certain antibiotic resistance, and at a certain point the bacteria kind of explodes or dies, and it releases all of its DNA into the surrounding. And then just some, some streptococcus happens to be in the neighborhood, and it just says, oh, nice, little piece of DNA, it slurps it in, and just starts transcribing the DNA, and now has the antibi antibiotic resistance gene just because of the fact that it happened to encounter it in the environment. Another way which is more common is bacterial conjugation, and this is when two bacteria make a little protein tube and start exchanging DNA with each other, which is like strange because you would think that two bacteria of different species would not talk to each other or would not kind of be friends with each other, but this is something that happens a lot. Right, so conjugation is when a little protein tube is made and bacteria just start exchanging plasmids, so these little circles of DNA which encode certain genes with each other. So, um, happens a lot. Um, furthermore, we have transduction, and transduction is something which happens by bacterial phages. So a bacterial phage uh, will be born in a bacteria, right? And this bacterial phage will then um, transfer genetic material from one bacteria to another bacteria. So using the intermediate, then it's called transduction. Of course, there's another very common horizontal gene transfer method, and that is just, of course, genetic engineering, 
right? In the lab, we often give bacteria new properties like antibiotic resistance or other properties. And we, of course, do this by um, just hey, using plasmids and then using electroporesis to put the plasmids into the bacteria. Or we use like these little um, lipofectamine bubbles. So we put the gene into a lipofectamine bubble and then f f merge this bubble with um, the, the bacterial cell. But there are three natural ways of horizontal gene transfer, transformation, bacterial conjugation and transduction, as well as genetic engineering, um, which is a non-natural non way of giving bacteria new properties. And all of these methods will make two species look as if there is a common ancestor more early in the tree than that there actually is. Right, because the DNA now is more similar because both of them have the exact same piece of DNA, but this is not due to having a common ancestor, but this is due to one of these horizontal gene transfer methods. So all of these methods cause xenology, right? So uh, a homolog from a horizontal gene transfer between two organisms. All right, so if we want to look at, at some of these, um, so if we want to look at proteins and analyzing proteins and classifying them into f families and predicting domains, then one of the things that you can use is from the European Bioinformatics Institute is Interpro. Um, and I didn't really prepare an example, but let's just look at the Interpro website so that you guys know that it exists and what you can actually do with it. Um, so let me show you Firefox, get rid of all of the weird pop-ups. Um, so here we have the Interpro database, right? So if we go to um, search, we can just search by sequence, by text or by domain architecture. We can also just browse, right? So we can say, well, just browse a certain protein. Um, which um, protein did I want to do? Let's do an example. All right. Um, we already had the insulin receptor, right? So let's just reuse the insulin receptor and then throw it into the Interpro database, right? So we just give the insulin receptor and then we just say search. And this should be relatively quick. Let me also see if the CC top prediction, no, the CC top prediction did not finish yet. Take some time. Bioinformatics is a like field where you just have to wait for things to do. Because you're always, like in this case, you're relying on someone else's computer doing the analysis and, and the computer might be busy. Um, so, or you might be in a queue just waiting until you can get serviced. I uh, should have actually, uh, let me actually, uh, I can probably just browse for human hemoglobin as well. Um, because we, oh, insulin receptor. Ooh, insulin receptor. That is not going very well either. <sighs> Such a shame. Like never do a live demo, right? That's, that's how the saying goes, that if you do a live demo, then all of a sudden everything starts not, not working at all. Why is this not doing anything? Kim, uh, uh, yeah, I agree with the stupid cookie. <sighs> it's always, always when, ah, nice. At least this one finished, right? So we can look at the results, right? So here we see that uh, we, what is mismatch version? I didn't choose any version. Anyway, so here we can see that the uh, insulin receptor from humans, the one that we just uploaded, is a protein, right? So, and this protein has 1,382 amino acids, right? And it is classified in a certain family because it is called terkinase insulin-like receptor, right? It is also part of the family insulin receptors, right? So, um, if we look at amino acid 5 to 138, and then we see that this whole thing is part of a family, which is logical because insulin receptors are very common, right? But then if we look at the protein itself, then we see that the protein consists more or less of three different parts, so three different domains, right? So one of the domains here is a receptor L domain, which is then 
split or found multiple times. So hey, you can see that here on the domain hey, from amino acid 52 to 470 there is a receptor L domain. If you want to learn more about it you can just click on it, see the description and stuff. Um, here we see that there's an FN3 domain um, and here we see that there's a protein kinase domain. Right, so protein kinases are there to, to cut proteins. So hey, we can we can see that this one is um, more or less split into three parts. We have also a chemokin receptor. Hey, so we, we can learn more or less how this protein is structured and organized. And hey, we can also see that there are several repeats, right? Like a furin repeat into the thing. We can see that there's a conserved site here, hey, which is a very, hey, so a conserved site is something which is which is the same in many, many different species. Um, and this is again part of the uh, tyrosine kinase 2 receptor. We see that the active site has been determined to be here. So this is where the insulin binds to the receptor. That happens somewhere between 1155 and amino acid 1176. We see that there's a binding site. So, oh no, so this is the active site. So this is the site that actually transmits the signal after binding. And here we see the binding site. So this is where the um, insulin binds the receptor. Um, then we have here integ an integrated part. So these are all predictions. Um, and here we see that there's more predictions for different signal peptides and transmembrane parts, right? So here there's a transmembrane area uh, where uh, so part of the insulin receptor is outside of, of the cell and part of it is inside in the cytosol. And uh, here we have a transmembrane region. So this is the region of the protein which goes through. Furthermore, it gives us which biological process, which molecular function, and which cellular component it, it has been classified into. And of course, we can we can click on all of these things and learn more about them. Um, let me actually. Yeah. So we can have we can zoom into the region of the protein, and then we can continue with searching with Interpro or with the HMMMR to do a prediction of the secondary structure of the protein. Um, what I actually wanted you guys to C is when we look at, for example, the binding site. Why? Yeah, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to just get the overview of the. Oh no, that doesn't have that because I just searched with a new protein. Um, that is annoying. Normally, when you take a protein which is known and you just go to the database, then it will also show you which um, mutations are known within this protein. Um, but it's an it's an interesting um, website to see. Okay, so I had this is a known domain in my protein. And based on the protein protein kinase domain, this protein has a certain function. Based on the domain here, it also and we can assume that this function is shared with other proteins as well as the furin-like cis-rich domain. Um, and of course, we can click on it and go through. If we want to learn more about the domains, we can actually click here. Right, so this is a, um, a receptor L domain, uh, the structure of the first three domains, blah, blah, blah. And hit, so it gives you overview references where you want to look further. Um, anyway, Interpro, it's a good website if you want to learn more about protein domains or if you want to learn more about protein um, structure. So did it actually finish the browse? Probably not. No, it's still running in the background. All right, so if you want to learn more about proteins. So if you just want to read something, then um, go to this big picture learning. It has a special issue on proteins. Um, and it's a relatively good link to find more about proteins. It's, it's quite good. What I like more is uh, the second link, which are the paper models. So the paper models come from PDB, um, the database uh, which is there for proteins. So that's the old protein database which was actually founded in the uh, 1970s. And if you, because 3D structures everything, um, one of the nice things is, is that, for example, the tRNA paper model, um, so you can just download the, the PDF, you print it, and then you can you can fold it yourself. So you can see which parts of the protein fold back on themselves, and they actually have a nice YouTube video on how to do this. Um, and you, it's based on this PDB structure. Um, so PDB, um, they have this um, 
really nice funny thing where you can fold your own proteins um, yeah, so they have a whole bunch of them so you can fold an antibody or you can do some DNA yeah, or you can for example fold the human papilloma virus or the G protein coupled receptor um, so really interesting website PDB itself is actually a very very good website for um, not PDB So the PDB website, the main website, not the learning website, actually it allows you to see protein structures. So where are the alpha helices? And so again, you can do your own prediction um, or you can just say, well, I want to know more about uh, insulin uh, uh, receptor, right? So if you look at the insulin receptor, then they have here different different crystal structures which are made of the insulin receptor and then here you can see indeed that this is crystallography of an active loop mutant of the insulin receptor and so you can click on it and then again it gives you an overview of the and so it gives you the uh, the structure which you can actually view in 3d as well um, and then hey, it gives you literature um, not just that but if you go down you can see for each of the parts of the protein if there are no mutations um, the hydropathy, so high, uh, if the part of the protein is actually liking water or not liking water, so the more um, the the more hyd the more hydrophilic it is, the more likely it is to be on the outside. The higher the hydropathy, um, the the more likely it is to be on the inside of the molecule. Um, and they have the PFOM domain, right? So this is the the PFOM domain, which is again related to the uh, interpro domain um, so and then hey you can see downstairs or downstairs you can see all the way down hey, that there are for example experimental data where you can see how well the structure was determined um, so it's a really interesting website to kind of uh, look through um, and hey you can also see that in this case there was a magnesium 2 plus ion in there so it's just if you want to know more about um, proteins in general then head PDB is the place to go and head just search for your protein and there's all kinds of links to all kinds of different websites if you want to learn more um, but it's a really interesting uh, interesting website and of course they have the proteins that you can fold yourself right and that's the nice thing because then you can just do it at home and for example I would definitely fold the tRNA so that's one that I did myself um, and that's actually uh, um, really interesting yeah, because if you look at the PDF um, and then here you have the the template if you want to do it in black and white if you want to do it in color and the only thing that you do is you just have to cut these out and then you glue them together um, on the right position and then in the end you have a really nice tRNA um, with the acceptor loop and the anticodon loop and here you have the thing done all right, so I think that's it for today. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint. So yeah, that's it for today. So I told you a little bit about the history of proteins, not so much about the history of proteins, but about the history of like methods that we use for protein determination. Um, I talked to you about protein structure. So what is the primary structure? Hey, primary structure is done by atomic bonding. What is the secondary structure? Secondary structure we take into account uh, hydrogen bonds, the tertiary structure we take into account ionic bonding and we take into account the hydrophobicity or the hydrophilicity of the protein so uh, which parts like to clump together because they are all hydrophobic and which parts are clumping or are on the outside because they like being in water. I told you about purification and identification so uh, that there are four different protein purification techniques and that you can identify proteins <coughs> using mass spec and nuclear um, NMR and um, other methodologies. Um, I told you about functional prediction. So I told you about that proteins are consisting of protein domains and that based on the protein domains, you can actually figure out what a protein is doing. Um, and I told you about that there are 60,000 different protein families. So proteins that are very similar are part of the same family. And again, that helps you understand if you are looking into a protein, what your protein might be doing. I told you a little bit about phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees will come back. Also how to make them yourself. Um, for example, using R, we did one in the beginning using HACLUS, but there are many, many different methods to make phylogenetic trees. I told you a little bit about homology and all of the 
different and confusing terms that are there like an ortho log, a powder log and a xenor log. So for the exam, just a little tip, know that I'm not going to ask in detail about in logs and out logs and stuff. I just want you to know what that an ortho log is different from a powder log, why it is different and what why a xenor log is different from a powder log. And of course, remember that xenologs are important because they make it seem that the shared ancestor is actually closer than that it actually is. And this happens a lot in bacteria where bacteria exchange DNA with one another. All right, so that's it for today. Are there any questions, remarks, um, suggestions and other things? Um, if not, then um, here's the beautiful guinea pig I drew today. Um, are there already dates for the exam? Yes and no. Um, yes, I submitted dates to the exam. No, I'm still waiting for an answer for the Prüfungsbüro. So, um, Yes, I submitted dates, but no, they are not confirmed yet. So once they're confirmed, I will let you guys, of course, know when the exam will be. And there's still a little bit of struggle with the Prüfungsbüro because they want me to do the exam in person and um, verbal, so oral exams. Um, but I just want you guys to do a written exam. And not that I don't want to see you guys, that's not the issue. It's just that I don't think that uh, it makes much sense to do an oral exam for something like bioinformatics. Um, but as soon as there are, then I will send around an email um, and then you will know exactly when the exam is. Good. Then at least I will stop the recording for um, YouTube. Yeah, no problem, uh, Jeannie. So people on YouTube, see you on the next lecture, which is going to be lecture six. Lecture six is going to be about, let me see, mathematics. So lecture six is going to be about um, either metabolomics and pathways or about programming in R. Um, that depends a little bit on you guys and also on you guys on, on YouTube. So um, probably we will have a little vote. Um, so I will probably do a vote on Moodle um, for you guys to determine which one of the two lectures you like to see more. But the next logical lecture, because we did DNA, we did RNA, we did proteins, um, then the next logical lecture would be to do metabolites and pathways and information about those. Good. So people on YouTube, um, See you on the flip side.